Uh, so I'm going to start the recording. Yeah. The meeting is being recorded. Awesome. Well, uh, good to see everybody. Uh, we're um, uh, doing the the discussion we're going to have tonight is uh, introduction to some of the background history on the on the landscape at Montpelier and a little bit about what you all are going to be experiencing um, when you uh, come on the program. Um, and uh, first, wanted to make sure that you all um, uh, have as a chance to ask any questions you might have about. I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Anybody else have a problem with the volume or the being able to hear me? No, no. I can hear you. Fine. Okay. Sure, maybe you need to um, turn the volume up maybe. So can you hear me now, Sharon? All right, well, in case anyone has their audio visuals go out too, I'm, gonna, I'm recording this and we can always, uh, I'll send it out to you all. Um, but uh, yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you, Sharon. Yeah. Um, but again, what I wanted to do was to see if anybody had any questions um, uh, about the program, wanted to make sure you all had the material. Uh, for example, um, what um, you know, items to bring, um, where to meet on on uh, on the Sunday night of the program you're on. Um, and most of you all are coming the first week in September. I know there's a couple of you all that are in the um, the alumni program, and it's going to be your first time. Um, and uh, I'm going to be doing another session that's kind of the inside baseball we for a lot for these programs we have probably like about 30 percent of the participants are folks that have come on five or more programs through the years so we have a lot of uh, alumni that keep on coming back so um it's uh really nice to make new friends like we're going to be making with you all and then also seeing old friends as well so but um, one of the things that um, we always start with is uh, really giving you all a sense of Montpelier in terms of the historic landscape. And this gets into something that we, we call this the power of place lecture, because one of the things you're going to experience in the week that you're here is really understanding Montpelier from a landscape angle, from the you know 2,650 acres that make up Montpelier. And um, uh, also each of you have a different perspective that you bring and uh, you'll gain new perspectives with the archeology. span But with, with starting, I always like to start with this question and we do a lot of conversations, so you'll get used to it for the week that you're here, is, um, what is when you heard, think of the term power of place, what, what comes to mind for you all? And some of you might've uh, heard, heard this term used before uh, with the uh, National Trust. Hmm. Maybe the people, the people that were in the place. Yeah, that, that is absolutely a huge power of place uh, for a historic property like Montpelier, both. And uh, Marianne, do you mean, what people do you mean? The people in the past or present or both? Uh, could be both, really. But mainly the past, I guess. Yeah, yeah, and and that's for you know for what you we we work with with the archaeology, it's something we're very interested in because you know we're not just finding you know just broken ceramics, glass, and pieces of bone for their own sake. We're interested in understanding the people who deposited those items and what how we can use the archaeological record to understand their lives. And um, a lot of times, you know, most for most of the artifacts we find at Montpelier they're giving us a different perspective through the archeology span than you ever get through the documentary record. Because you can imagine most of the sites we work on at Montpelier were um, created and lived in by the enslaved community. So, and there's not a lot of records that relate to the enslaved Americans who lived and worked at Montpelier. So that's an incredibly um, important part of all this. Uh, what else comes to mind for you all with power, the, you know, the idea of power or place?
we'll we'll have a we'll have a chance to talk with with this um with you all more anybody um uh how many of you all have ever been to uh to montpelier i haven't so john and todd you've been okay sharon you've been what when you were there what really hit you when you were at montpelier Yeah, Todd. Um, you know, for me, it's, you know, I walked around. The first time I went there, they had just started uh, renovating. So it was, mm. everything was kind of stripped down to the basics. This is probably 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, just the whole concept that, you know, what these walls have seen and that they could talk the stories they could tell. <clears throat> yeah, that was an incredible time to be at Montpelier. We did tours all during the restoration. So we didn't close the house uh, with the restoration. We had people coming in uh, live. What struck me was you have Washington, then Richmond, you have Montpelier, you have uh, Jefferson's home, Charlottesville. It just felt like this whole area um, had all these momentous things happen. And um, sort of the uh, the center of what formed where you know what we are uh, now living with. So the, it was just not just Montpelier, but the entire area was uh, uh, um, very uh, impactful for me. Yeah, so more of a meta power of place, like in terms of the formation of the you know early history of this country. Yeah, absolutely, and that's something that people comment on is how many founding fathers came from Virginia. And what a lot of historians have come up with is that, that you know, a lot of this came from the tremendous amount of wealth that was generated uh, from plantation slavery. And the early period that slavery um, was used in, you know, utilized in Virginia. And uh, then, and we're, you you all will see how this history you know, we'll talk a little bit about this tonight, about how this history of wealth um, really it changed through time. Uh, and at the Mont Montpelier is a really, it, it, there. you know, all these plantations are unique, but the his economic history follows a pattern that, um, you know, is really on a national scale and uh, begin to understand, you know, how, how James Madison got to be who he was. And, so, and certainly where his genius came from, he certainly had that, but the um, the uh, the opportunities that you know enslaved people provided was a huge part of that as well. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, the, Sharon, um, can, you can you hear us now? Yeah, I signed awesome. in and I now have the. Um, I was impressed with how much um, Killer has done with the about the enslaved and enslaved communities and descendants. Whereas it was like the Shella, it's beginning to even recognize that they were able to go on a tour there and talk about the servants, not the slaves. You're, you're pretty broken up, Sharon, but I, could, I think I could uh, make out some of what you said about the um the presence of the enslaved community and the work we're doing with the descendants made it very different than a lot of other places yes. yeah that's we we're in a really interesting place right now with our um the management of montpelier and have it we're under co-stewardship with the montpelier descendants committee and that's something that as many of y'all have likely read about um that was a, a long, intense process over the past two years. And we're, we'll, we'll dive into this a lot with the tours that we do, especially <clears throat> the work that we're doing right now, surveys of the Montpelier burial ground. This is the cemetery for the enslaved community. And um, what we're discovering there and what the MDC is looking to build as a, as a memorial there. So, well, one thing wanted to, you know, always start with the, this question is because anytime during the discussion tonight, and I hope it is a discussion, you know, jump in with questions. I don't know if you all have had a chance to look at the readings that we, we sent you all over email. Um, 
did you all get those like some of the the archaeology booklet mm. yes yes okay and if anyone anyone didn't just drop me a note I'll, i'm gonna i'm gonna send the recording of this to everybody and if there's um there's probably be some things that come up tonight that i'll send you more advanced readings on and uh, we'll be able to share those so but what i'll do at this point is i'm going to go ahead and um um and share screens um let me see uh we've got and again if you have questions don't hesitate just uh um you don't need to put your hand up uh just go ahead and uh and jump in um and can you all see let me see i'm going to bring up the uh the map right now can you all see the map yeah okay awesome and i'm going to hide floating meeting control so i can see the screen here but um a lot of what we're going to talk about tonight i'm going to do through some of the gis maps that we've got of the property this is a, a map showing montpelier the brown is the um the extent of the property that the national trust for historic preservation owns today we've got about 2650 acres and in the middle of this you've got you know the main house which is just right in the middle of all of the uh, the property and then the visitor center is just adjacent to the um to the main house and for most visitors what they experience is pretty much you know, driving up to the visitor center, going through, getting their ticket and going to the main house. A lot of folks just experience this small area, but we've got, you know, not only trails that extend out into the historic core, like over to the Madison Family Cemetery, but also to the site that we're going to be um, uh, working on uh, when you all are here in September, which is the overseer's site. We've got, um, uh, and this is an aerial view of this same situation. Here's the site where you're all gonna be working on. We've got all these units that are opened up. And then here's the visitor center and parking lot. And the background, you can see the main house up here. And here's the temple back here. Lab, archeology span lab is way down here. But this is pretty much the core of what most people experience. And what we've got at Montpelier is uh, like I said, a little, little over uh, 2,600 acres that includes the core of the plantation. So when I zoom out, you can see the gray shaded area right here. This is the original core of the plantation that was owned by the Madisons. And then some of these adjacent areas on the edges on the, on the southwest area and the northeast, these are adjacent plantations that when the DuPonts buy the property in 1901, they start buying adjoining land parcels to this center section they, that they bought. And by 1920, they've amassed about 5,000 acres and about, uh, about two thirds of the original Madison plantation. And so when the trust gave the property to us back in 1984, it included this core of the plantation, which was really, was really fortunate because that's where the majority of the sites are. You know, of course, the main house but then all these support sites, you know, that we're looking at at the home farm and uh, the core of the plantation was in this land mass. And what we've got with the with this land is incredible preservation. I mean, when the DuPont spot in 1901, um, most of the land that had been in farmland in the 18th and early 19th century hadn't been plowed since that time. And with the DuPonts, they are they essentially make it into a country estate. So um, you can see in this picture right here, this is down where the archaeology lab is. They did, um, you know, carriage carriage racing. They they had greenhouses. This is a shot of the greenhouses where um, Lewis Hall is, where the lab um, is located today. And it was pretty much a country estate. And what that meant was, is that, all of the the land when you get into the 1920s and 30s when you have more commercialized agriculture that happens like with with you know tractors and plowing the duponts they don't need to cut the trees or clear the fields and grow crops to make money this is the duponts and you i'm sure you all are familiar with the duponts like wilmington delaware um of chemical fame uh so you we've got this incredibly well-preserved landmass that today 
like when you look at the um what what today is the home farm um in uh, in this area you've got fields that have been unplowed since they were abandoned in the 1840s when dolly madison sold the property and sold you know, over 100 the, the 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 entire enslaved community that consisted of over 100 people and so the archaeology we literally dig down you know four or five inches and we're at this early 19th century surface so you know for example in the south yard that we'll you all will see and we'll go into a little more detail on in this in the talk tonight you go down four or five inches and you're at this early 19th century surface with the foundations of buildings and then massive scatters of artifacts and you all will see this in your excavations that you're going to be doing when you're here but um mm. uh one of the things that makes this incredibly important is um how many of y'all have been to uh to monticello and visited monticello yeah. Well, you probably when you were there, you probably you know they they've got incredible access there to you know uh, plats of the property that show where the fields are located, where the slave quarters are, and Jefferson's uh, garden book and farm book that has you know the amount of uh, bushels of wheat harvested from each each field. All those records end up ended up being burned at Montpelier in the 1850s, and this is. After, I don't know if you've heard of John Payne Todd. He's the wayward stepson of James Madison. This is Dolly's uh, son from her first marriage. He, um, you know, uh, during his adult life and in his management of Montpelier, he was uh, a gambler and a drunk and, and racked up incredible debts for Dolly and James Madison, trying to keep him out of debtor's prison. But after Dolly Madison, uh, uh, passes away in 1848, all of the family documents end up in his hands down in Gordonsville, which is just to the south of, of Montpelier. Gordonsville, here's Montpelier right here. Gordonsville is the town just down here. And Todd's birth is about in this area right here. And when he dies in 1854, all of Madison's nieces and nephews go to his house, find two rooms full of documents, decide that Uncle Jimmy, this is President Madison, would have there's just they decided there's way too much scandal in those documents they hauled them all out into the back lawn and put a match to them and so mm -hmm. with that yeah it's just heartbreaking you, you know there would have been uh maps of the property receipts for items purchased uh lists of slaves all this is burned up uh so this is where the archaeology becomes incredibly important because you know locating the sites that we found across the property is is possible because of the incredible preservation that we've got. And so um, the the map that I've, I've got right here, this is what's called a GIS map. I'm going to send you all a copy of this um, with a recording later on, either tonight or tomorrow morning. And in this, you can explore, you know, a lot of the sites that we're, we're doing work on. So for example, in the area of the home farm, all these sites that are the yellow squares with the gray um, shading, these are sites that we've excavated and there's information mm -hmm. associated with that you can explore and look at. So this is essentially like, you know, if you're in Google Maps and you um, click on a restaurant, you can come up with the menu, photos of things. The, these maps contain all of these records. And actually, when you zoom in, you can drill in even further. We've got um, reports that you can download, for example, the Mount Pleasant site. And so when you click on this, you've got a a report from 2002 mm -hmm. that's 45 pages that's one of the shorter reports so you can just you know drill and drill and drill into all this and get all kinds of information with these maps and I'll, I'll send this to you all afterwards but one of the things we also have is all the units that we've excavated and so for example at the overseer's house that where we're going to be working this week um the this site uh is um a uh, shown on a 1844 plat. So this plat right here shows the overseer's house between being between the main house, the Madison's uh, dwelling and the, the mill. And there's the overseer's house labeled. And this is exactly where in metal detector surveys, we found concentrations of nails, but then also there was a, a well found in the 1970s that indicated there was a site here. And 
so with, with these um, uh, sites, what we're, uh, we've done, you know, is opened up units. And when you zoom in, these units appear. And so these are, you know, current, uh, these have the, um, some of the current features that we're working on right now. Like for example, this feature right here um, is uh, one of the subfloor pits that we're excavating this season. This is a picture of, um, of the, uh, of this, this pit feature that Mac just excavated. Um, and so this was just taken about a week ago. So we, we keep up to date with all this. So there's just all kinds of information you can get at with this. But, but at this point, what I wanted to do was to get into some of the, um, of the, uh, of the, of the history of the landscape and do this in a, um, uh, a, a time, a time by, by time period. And I'm going to take a second to turn off some of these, these maps because it gets a little bit busy with zooming in. But um, for the, for the Madison period, there's about three, there are three generations of Madisons that owned Montpelier. And each one of these generations grew, you know, basically operated Montpelier in a very different way. So I don't know, anybody familiar with Francis Madison, the grandmother of the president? You know, would have a chance to. Well, her home site was down at what right beside the overseer's house where you're going to be working this week. And it's called Mount Pleasant. And this site consists of about three buildings that we found archaeologically. This is a, a painting that we had commissioned back in the early 2000s based on the archaeology with the main house, the kitchen, slave quarter, and then outbuildings. And this is one of the earliest sites in the Virginia Piedmont, and Francis Madison operates Montpelier. Um, basically, she becomes a widow in 1732 when her husband, Ambrose Madison, who's the grandfather of the present, he's poisoned by two of the enslaved workers at Montpelier, and then an, a, 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 a enslaved individual from adjacent plantation. And so she runs the plantation under her own name, from 1732 all the way up until her death in 1761. And during that time, the chief crop that's being produced is tobacco. And so how a lot of the uh, tobacco cultivation takes place is not with plowing, but with hoe-based agriculture where the, the trees would be girdled, mm -hmm. which would kill them, cut the bark off in a ring, and then the enslaved would hoe the soil into piles and then grow the, um, in hills, uh, tobacco hills and grow the tobacco there. And during this time period, James Madison's father, James Madison Sr., um, he's born around 1732. And by 1741, um, he's born in 1723, but because by 1741, he's 18. And so, he comes into his seniority in the 18, 1740s, and when he's when he marries Nellie Conway Madison in 1749, instead of settling down here at Mount Pleasant, they settle up at Montpelier, not in the 18th century portion of the house that you know we've known about for years. This is what the main house looked like in the around the time of the American Revolution but in another smaller dwelling that we refer to today as the planter's cottage. And this is a, 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 a building that we just recently discovered through archaeology um, in the South Yard. And we'll talk about this. We're going to explore a lot of these sites when you all visit, when you all are here for the week. But this, this building was built in the 1750s, and it wasn't until another 15 years later, this is after Francis Madison dies, the grandmother, that the main house was built. So essentially when Frances Madison is alive, the grandmother, she keeps the family seat down at Mount Pleasant. And it's only after she dies that James Madison's, James Madison's parents, her son, begins to build the main house. So she's really remains as the matriarch of Montpelier. And so, you know, a lot of this history, all this has been discovered through combining the document, what we know from the documentary records with the archaeology. And so the 30 years of archaeology we've been doing at Montpelier has allowed us to really, you know, um, this landscape preservation has allowed us to understand the history <laughs> of the Madison family, but then, of course, also the enslaved community. 
because you can imagine with over you know there there for every uh, uh one free white person whether it's the madisons or an overseer there are about 25 enslaved individuals at montpelier at one in one time so you've got you know the majority of the folks at montpelier were enslaved and you know what is that what is that what do you think that does in terms of the archaeology? What do you think the majority of the sites are that we find are related to? Yeah, John, you're nodding. It's uh, it's it's slavery. Yeah, it's the the Dennis uh, Bajorkland, who's our metal detectorist. Uh, he's done surveys all across the property, gridded metal detector surveys, and he'll show show you how he does these uh, uses the metal detector to find these sites. He can literally, you know, he's found probably over 20,000 artifacts that he's sampled and, and, uh, and, and cataloged uh, through metal detector surveys. He literally can count on, he said, in less than the number of fingers on his hand, the number of artifacts that would have been, you know, lost by a member of the Madison family. And it's a, a ring, a um, uh, two silver uh, thimbles over by the temple, and that's about it. So, you know, really the, the landscape in many ways is a memory device for the enslaved community. And for the descendant community, this has been incredibly important. Um, in the work we've done, for example, in the South Yard, um, in, we, we got a grant from David Rubenstein to do the archeology span and reconstruct the South Yard. Um, we uh back in 2015 we started doing very intensive work with the descendant community and for them you know finding artifacts in the ground and you know for them the last person that touched these artifacts that they're digging out of the ground in the unit was likely either a relative you know going back to enslavement or somebody that would have knew one of their their relatives. So it's literally, you know, the history of their ancestors, you know, they can hold in their hand and they're the first one to have touched it, you know, in doing the archeology. span So this is a lot of what, um, you know, you all are gonna experience the same thing. There's this, you know, literal connection with history that you can have um, from the work that you all are gonna be doing. And it, it's all this contributes to understanding this, this larger picture. So, um with the um with the landscape um you know when you look at the the main house it's gone through a number of different changes we we've restored the main house back to its early 19th century appearance with the the wings on either side and the front portico but of course how it used to look this the the main house these two chimneys that you can see right here this is the core of the main house between this chimney and this chimney as it was built around 17 by by enslaved masons back in 1765. So this is what the main house looked like during the American Revolution. You know, but uh, a uh, a Georgian structure with flanking outbuildings that were out in front of the house. And in the early 19th century when James and Dolly Madison are, you know, preparing for retirement, what they arrange for is, you know, these buildings that were out in front to be torn down and they make this much more picturesque landscape with a, a line of pine trees that runs from the portico over to the temple. And then this grove of trees leading over to what we call the Boxwood Grotto over here. And then the South Yard as well. And there's two 18th century buildings in the South Yard, but these, the two smokehouses and the duplexes here date to the early 19th century. And then all this is what would have been termed a picturesque landscape. And so much of the work we've done, we did in the, you know, from around 2002 through about 2018, <laughs> focused on this landscape. And, you know, you can imagine why we were doing this is, you know, we had restored the main house. And when we were restored the main house, um, this was back around, uh, we had completed the restoration by 2000 and, um, and, and eight, you know, the landscape around the main house was devoid of any buildings. And so, like, for example, in the South Yard, this is a shot taken in 2011 when we had done the archaeology on these duplexes, is we wanted to begin to represent these buildings back. And so we started with, you know, doing the archaeology, doing the goose timber frames, 
And then it was, um, you know, much later, you know, uh, well, not much later, about five years after when we completed the archaeology, that we rebuilt, in this case, all of the buildings associated with the South Yard. So when you're here in about a week, we're going to we're going to go into a lot of the details of how we go from the archaeological record to the actual built environment. And what's you know really remarkable about Montpelier is that you know to excavate a site, you know, we, we worked in the in the South Yard for over um uh eight years, you know, excavating uh not only the um the duplexes, these two buildings with the central chimneys, but also the um the the smoke houses that uh you can see in this image right here. The, this is a shot in 2015 of the excavations of the smoke houses with the fire pits that were in the middle and then the the wooden the wooden beams that rotted and formed these trenches that gave us the dimensions of these buildings. And then finally the um the uh what we call the north dwelling and the kitchen this building right here being the planter's cottage dating to the 1750s these 18th century buildings with a with brick foundations that that all this archaeological data went into the restoration of the south yard and so a big part of what we do with the archaeology you know isn't just to do you know academic research it's actually to understand what this landscape looked like so we can not only generate you know this is a 3d rendering of the uh of the main house uh that's done in in a, a 3d uh gis program called um uh 3ds max but to actually bring these sites to life and um and that's the whole point of having a historic property like montpelier is to allow visitors to begin to you know immerse themselves into this space and so, um, you know, uh, when we doing these expedition programs, we started these expedition programs back in 2006. And the front yard was one of the first areas we started doing excavations in the front here. And those excavations were some of the first where, you know, we found through the archaeology evidence of this fence line with the, the post holes. The, this is looking into one of these post holes that we found through the archaeology and uh when we were excavating it we found the squared off remains of a post mold that gave us the dimensions of the post that then allowed us to actually do the restoration of this of this site um in what you see um you know uh in um you know i don't oh no i've got a picture of the front yard that's with the uh yeah, this right here, and this picture right here, you can see the restored front fence right there. So um, what's really amazing for a lot of expeditioners, because we have you know people that come back year after year on these programs, is they're actually able to go from you know digging on one of these sites to actually seeing the features they found be restored into the built landscape. So where we're working with you all over the next, you know, in, in a couple of weeks when you all are here, we're, we've pretty much finished the area of the main house. I mean, there's a lot more to excavate here in, the, in and around the main house. Not only do we have these, um, you know, the evidence from the 19th century, but we've got literally 18th century sites that are buried below the 19th century landscaping. So we've restored the house to its early 19th century appearance in this shot. But in here, you can see this building right here dates to around 1765, but it was taken down in 1810 to allow the wing to be built. And so not only do you have this 19th century landscape, like for example, in the, uh, um, the South Yard with the, um, with the duplexes and the smokehouses, but you've got these 18th century buildings that are buried under 18 teens landscaping fill. And so the, in, in, in the case of this site, what we found is when the um, when the um, Madison's hire this Mason Hugh Chisholm, and this name will come up a lot, Hugh Chisholm, he's the, he's the Mason that the Madison hired in 1810 to not only build the wings, but also underpin the entirety of the 1765 house because the foundation was failing. And they took, the enslaved took all the bricks 
And after these buildings were taken down, buried this 18th century site. And so this layer of brick rubble serves as a horizon marker for which everything below it we know was put there before 1810. Everything above it is after 1810. And this, this, this rubble deposit is one that is not only over in this area, but all the way over into the area of the um of the uh of the what we call the grove, all of this area in here. And it's hard to see, but there's all this brick rubble in here, and you get the foundation of a building right here. And then it covered over some of these uh, planting stains from the 1840s. So, you know, what you'll you'll recognize when you start playing with these maps is that like when you zoom into this, for example, and you start seeing all these units, these are unit, all these units are units that we've excavated over the past two, two decades. So there's literally, you know, thousands of units, you know, underneath the main house in the cellar spaces, we've done excavations. And each of these has, again, there are reports for all of these. When you click through, you can access the um, the reports for the these areas. And oh, I turned off the reports. And the map I sent you, the, or the reports will be there. But again, with these maps, you can really start drilling into this data. And one thing that we'll we'll talk about when you're here on fr on Friday is we have an opportunity where we have volunteers, previous expedition members, who are actually digitizing all of these excavation records so that um, you know the photos for all these are um, you can actually access. So like this is a photo of a um, one of the scaffolding holes under the portico that we excavated when we were restoring the main house dating to the 1840s. And so all of these excavation records that have been digitized, we've got you know a record, a photographic record and details on. So again, you can, you know, if anybody has uh, problems with sleeping at night, you can start really <laughs> diving into all this. So, but for the site we're working on um, when you're here this week, this is all the area of these fields below the visitor center. So again, to give you a perspective on this, and first, anybody have any questions about you know some of the, the, the sites around the main house? Anybody have a chance to look at any of the, the information in the booklets? No, not yet. Not yet, okay. And that is that is not unusual. We, we send a lot of information out to the expedition, to you all. And actually, once you're here at Montpelier, we're going to give you uh, the the PDF on archaeological sites. We'll give you that booklet. And that's something that you all will be able to use as a guide when we do tours because of the photos. But a lot of this will have a lot more meaning for you when you've actually walked out on the landscape and seen this. And when you're here for the week, you know, you're going to have, you know, access to the property you know in the evenings and the early mornings as well so you can explore all this area so um and i know a number of y'all are staying local to the area and uh, a couple of you all might be staying at arlington house or in the village but um the area that we're going to be working on is an area that is uh immediately you know uh, within vis visual proximity of the visitor center. So when you look at this, I'm going to close out some of these images here. Um, I've got a lot of windows open and that tends to bog the computer down. When you, um, in this shot right here, you can see, again, this is the view from the overseer's house looking towards the visitor center. And we've been talking a lot about the main house and the grounds up here. Well, from the visitor center, you're you're actually closer to this farm complex in this area mm -hmm. as compared to the main house. And when you look at this visitors where where these fields are at the visitor center, this is a, a map showing you know the sites that we found through metal detector survey. And another view of this is this map right here. This is a 3D image of this same landscape. So again, here's the present day landscape of the visitor center up here. The overseer's house that we're gonna be working on is over right here. And this is a 3D image of what this area looked like in the 1820s based on the archeological work that we've done. So the visitor center is up here. 
here's the overseer's house down here. And there's literally this village that consisting of blacksmith shops, uh, a, uh, a threshing barn, a tobacco barn up here. And on Monday, the, um, Mac, who's one of the archaeological staff, she'll give you all a, a tour of, of, the, of this site um, for you all to have a better understanding of literally what the overseer's house looked over in terms of this farm complex. And um, I don't know, did any of you all have a chance to look at the, um, at the, the, um, any of the web maps on the home farm of the story maps? There's one that talks about uh, metal detector surveys that we've done. You're able to see that, John? Yeah, what we've done is how we've located all these sites is through metal detector survey. And so this is a shot um, at the overseer's house looking up towards the uh, towards the, the Madison family cemetery up here. And it gives you an idea of these different grids that we use. So if you look at the Montpelier map as a whole um, and turn on the 20 meter grid, this is a grid on based on a 20 meter interval, which is about 60 feet by 60 feet or about a 10th of an acre each one of these squares here, the metal detector is sweep each one of these squares and mark any of the hits that, you know, are show up with the metal detector. And when you're looking for a historic site, you know, and you're looking for a building, what do you think the most frequent occurring artifact is? Nails. Yeah, exactly, Todd, nails. And it's what, um, uh, metal detectorists, you know, after, after they've been here for a week, uh, so a lot of them started calling Montpelier gold because, you know, a lot of metal detectorists come to Montpelier and they're expecting to find buttons or buckles. And then we tell them, nope, you know, 90% of what you're going to be finding is nails. There's kind of a collective groan because this is the stuff a lot of metal detectorists will throw away. But with the nails, these concentrations of nails actually mark where buildings are. And when you look at these nails, what they um, what they document is not only where the buildings are, but the nail manufacturing changes through time. So during the American Revolution, during this first phase of like the 18th century, all the nails are rot nails. And then when you move into the 1790s and 18 teens, they're machine cut nails. And because of the preservation that we've got with Montpelier, especially with the soils, you can literally identify the manufacturer type of these nails as it comes out of the ground. And when you all are here next, you know, in a couple of weeks, you're going to become experts on not only nails, but ceramics. You're going to learn about all these artifacts and how to date them. And oh. so with the nails, not only do they allow us to locate these sites and for these guys, this is um, this, the, 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 this color chart here, shows the concentrations like green is zero to five. And then when you get up to red, it's 82 to 300. And you can imagine where these sites are is where you've got concentrations of these nails. So for example, over here, this is a huge spot because of you've got a blacksmith shop and a, um, a set of quarters. And over here, where the overseer's house is right here in the Madison Family Cemetery, you've got this major concentration and what we do is after we find these sites on the 20 meter grid, we come in and open up a 10 foot grid. And with a 10 foot grid, you're going from this larger unit of scale down to a 10 foot grid. And what the 10 foot grids allow us to do is actually locate where the buildings are. So for example, on the 20 meter here, um, all this area kind of blends into one blob. But when you start opening up units on a 10 foot grid, all of a sudden, what you can um, what you can see is, for example, the blacksmith shop right here pops out, the overseer's site pops out right here. And actually, with the overseer's site, there's an earlier 18th century site that shows up over here that's differentiated from the, from the overseers. And, you know, you what you can do is literally see the buildings on the landscape. These are two sheds that we found back in 2011. And we open up units in these areas. What starts to pop out is, you know, where you date where the nails are is also where um, features are 
for these buildings. So, so for example, this is a pier from one of the uh, a pier for for the um, for the forge building at the blacksmith shop. And in these units in here, what we found was you, when you get into this area right in here, your amount of slag increases dramatically. And then what's out in this area is all this clipped iron that's the waste from the blacksmithing. So we were literally able to find the forge. We found the blacksmith shop using the metal detector survey where the concentrations are and where the buildings are. In this case, that you can imagine with a blacksmith shop, there's a lot of iron that shows up. And so it's more than just nails. There's also slag has metallic content, as does you know all the, the wasting waste or iron, the clipped iron. But we're with opening up the units, we were literally able to figure out where the building is. And with the overseer's house, it's a similar situation where, you know, over the past two years, we've opened up units. You can see where the these concentrations of iron objects are, the nails. This is where we focused our metal detector surveys. And this was also reinforced. We did ground penetrating radar here, and that gave us direction on some of the features that we found in this area. But long story short is, you know, we use these metal detector surveys to locate where the buildings are and figure out, you know, in some cases, you know, where to place units, but also some of the next sites that we want to excavate. So if you look at this map as a whole here, here's the visitor center right here. Here's the, uh, the main house right here. And then up in this area, you'll see these concentrations in here. This is where Dennis, you know, right by the, the temple is right here. Here's the temple. Just down the hill from that, Dennis found this concentration that turns out to be this early 19th century um, uh, set of uh, homes for the enslaved families that extends all the way down this ridge. When you zoom out here, all this area is loaded with artifacts from the living spots. And then that's right beside this 18th century blacksmith shop. So, and we haven't, we've never opened up units in these areas. So there's a lot of areas that we found not only around the main house, but as you zoom out and for example, go to the East Woods and um, you might've gotten a link for the East Woods in, in some of the readings. We've got sites out here that we've done the metal detector survey and 20 meter grid and then open up the 10 foot grid. And, you know, we, we've got just hundreds of sites that we've found that we need to excavate. And even with the metal detector survey, when you look at the amount of land that makes up Montpelier, the area in green with all these orange and red splotches, we've only surveyed up here at Gilmore, we've only surveyed about a, a quarter of the Montpelier landmass. And so we've got, you know, three quarters of this left to do metal detector survey on. So there's just, you know, an almost you know, in terms of someone, you know, a, a lifetime of archaeology here, it's an, an infinite number of sites, you know, because there's just no way to excavate all these. But what we've done is we've focused in, you can see here, between basically in the visitor core, we've completed all the metal detector surveys in this area, because this is probably where the heaviest concentration of, you know, sites are. And then also, of course, this is, you know, the, the center for visitation and where, you know, we want to be reconstructing these sites because, you know, for visitors, um, most people aren't going to get all the way out into the East Woods on a, a normal two hour visit at Montpelier. So, but, um, but does anybody have any, you know, questions or, um, or uh, things you want to ask about with all this? Yeah, John. So Matt, this this is my first time, as you know. Could you just run us through a typical day? Yeah, absolutely. Um, for the schedule, I'll I'll I'll, um, I'll send you all uh, the schedule. Um, Chris uh, Pash is going to be making that schedule up uh, this week. Um, but a typical day uh, starts at eight o'clock, and so you all will be given the gate code uh, to get onto the property. And um, the one of the first things we do just about every morning is do a site tour. So from about eight until about nine thirty, you know, we're going to be we'll be giving you all tours of one morning. It'll be the Gilmore cabin. 
Another uh, time, it'll be the Civil War encampments that are in the northern part of the property, these Confederate encampments. Um, uh, South Yard, uh, the um, uh, burial grounds. But by 10 o'clock, you'll be at the site excavating, and you'll, on average, work until about 3 or 3.30 um, in the afternoon. And uh, the first, first couple of days, Monday and Tuesday, um, on average, you'll spend about four hours in the field, and then the rest will be, we'll have some tours in the afternoon and in the morning. But for um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, you'll be in the field. But Friday, you spend the day in the lab. So you'll on on Monday, and the at, late afternoon you'll come you'll we'll go back to the lab and the lab is over. Um, turn off the twenty meter map here. The lab is over in this uh, tw the early twentieth century uh, Dupont farm complex. Um, all this area was built up when Dolly Madison sold the property in eighteen forty four. This farm complex is abandoned over here, and the new farm is built over in this area. And the archaeology lab is the building um, uh, over above the uh, the Lewis Hall parking lot, which used to be um, the greenhouses. This is a shot. This is like, gosh, this is like about eight, 18 years ago. Here's the archaeology office. The lab now is in this place <laughs> where the greenhouses were. That's all a parking lot. These were um, DuPont era greenhouses that came down about eight, about about 17 years ago now. But um, yeah, they'll four of the days will be in the field and then one day will be in the lab. And the lab, we do the lab on Friday and you all process all the finds that you made during the week. And it's really a, um, it's a time where you'll be able to see the product of all your excavations. And we've got study collections in the lab in, in drawers that you can pull out and uh, uh, really begin to look at the finds that you've made. Does that answer your question, John? Cool. Sharon, yeah. yeah I'm going to say Arlington House. Is that walkable to the sites? Arlington House is um, is uh, about uh, a 35 minute walk. So if you look at the map right here, Arlington House is right here. There's Arlington House. And it's the first day I'd recommend, we'll talk about this because all of you all are gonna arrive at Arlington on Sunday for the dinner. And so for getting to Arlington House, you come down Route 20, make a, um, either if you're coming from Charlottesville area, a right onto Jackson Town Road and then go up the driveway. Um, but probably gonna wanna drive from Arlington House. Are you driving, Sharon? Well, my sister had to go up to Northern Virginia on Friday night. I was gonna have her drop me off on Sunday and then just have her pick me up again on Friday. Yeah, well, the, the interns live at Arlington and you'll be able to get a ride with them. Okay. So yeah, and I I think um I think there's just two people staying at Arlington House. So yeah. Big place for two people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's uh we um uh for alumni we have folks stay at Arlington House, but it's um it's an older house, so um I've it's, stayed there before. You yeah you've stayed there before yeah that's. That's we usually uh, want people to understand what Arlington House is before they stay there because it's uh, um, being an older house. There's mice in it, and it just it's what a old house is. So being in the country, if you've got uh, get a house, you're going to have other residents living there as well. So any other questions? I assume we get a lunch break in between the. At some point, and how much time, and should we plan on brown bagging? Yeah, no, thank you, Todd. Absolutely, yeah, we do a lunch break, um, and that's about a half hour or forty minutes. And there's usually not enough time to go into. People usually brown, always brown bag it. Uh, we don't. We have there's limited sandwiches at the visitor center. So if you need to buy a sandwich, you can buy get one at the visitor center but they're um, ones that are made in town in the morning and they're, you know, pre-racked, so. What do we need to um, 
where for Sunday and Friday evening? Um, first, uh, basically, um, it's uh, the dinner on Sunday is pretty casual, you know, so, you know, it's come as you are. Um, and uh, we're going to be, if it's nice out, we'll eat outside and the picnic benches outside of Arlington. And then Friday, uh, we do a reception in the afternoon. But um, uh, and then it, uh, you all are free to leave like about three or three thirty. Uh, that's the end reception. Uh, um, and we do that in the lab. So you're you'll be wearing what you wear in the lab that day. So no fancy dinners, Sally. It's uh, you know, <laughs> no, pretty... no, that's fine. It just the information that was sent just said what we should bring for the field work and didn't really indicate anything else. Oh, I got you. Yeah, that's there. Yeah, no dress code uh, needed. So it's uh, but yeah, for the um, for the field, you know, we recommend long pants um, and uh, you know just for the. Um, there's bugs out in the field and you know some some uh, some gnats especially the uh, there's um all these horrible um uh sweat bees that um can be a, a bit of a, a literal pest so bringing some bug repellent is good i prefer just wearing long sleeves and long pants do you got do you bring something i see people kneeling on stuff when they're digging do you have to bring something or you guys provide that diff if you want um, a nice, fresh, um, soft knee pad, bring a knee pad. Uh, the ones we have are pretty worn out. So, okay. um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend bringing a knee pad. That's, uh, um, at, at my age, I've, um, gone through my knees. So I need, always, I need a knee, kneeler to kneel on. So, okay. and Marianne, you should have gotten a list of items to bring. Um, if you, I uh, don't have that. I can send that to you. Okay. I'll I'll put I'll add that to the list. Okay. And I'll just I'll just put all the links for everybody um, for the readings, uh, what to bring, and um, and the introductions to the staff. So. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, cool. Looking forward to seeing you all um, in a little over um, a little over a week. Um, and I know there's one or two of you all that are um, coming. I'll stop sharing screens here. Um, uh, let's see. Well, a couple of you all that are um, going to be coming on the alumni program in uh, mid-September. But um, and again, we're this this lecture is for you know to give you an introduction to the history of Montpelier and uh, um, looking forward to having you all at the at the site and digging with you all. So, and if you have any questions or need anything, you can e you can email me. I'll send you my email. Um, I'll be sending the recording to you all. Um, and also, you can email Melissa um, at Dig, who you've been communicating with. So, all right, great. All right, we'll see you on Sunday night and safe travels, everybody. Very Thank good. you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.